Okay, so in this video, I'm going to take a look at the uh, June 2006 Unifying Concepts paper from OCR, uh, which mimics quite accurately the Unifying Concepts paper um, in the new specification. Okay, so let's start off by having a look at some measurements and taking them as and making them as accurate as possible. So we've got three simple measuring devices, a tape measure, a kitchen scales and a watch, um, which would allow us to measure distance, um, mass or weight and the time. So using these items, outline how you can determine the following. So we're going to measure a few different things. So the thickness, first thing you want to find out is the thickness of a sheet of paper in a paperback book. So um, first thing we do is we'd measure the thickness of all of the sheets of paper in a book and we'd use a tape measure because we're measuring a distance. And then what we do is we divide the total thickness by the number of pages to get the thickness of one page. That would be the most accurate way of measuring uh, the thickness of one page as if we try to measure just one on its own, uh, the precision of our tape measure is not going to be good enough for that. Um, the mass of a paper clip. So again, the mass of one paper clip is going to be too small for a standard set of kitchen sales to pick up. So what we're going to do is we're going to measure the mass of maybe like 1000 paper clips and then divide by the total mass by 1000 to get the mass of just one on its own. Uh, we want to measure the diameter of a large cylindrical stone column in a cathedral. Um, so the thing we can actually measure fairly straightforwardly with a tape measure would be the circumference. That's the easiest thing to measure. And I'd measure it in a few different places and get an average circumference. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide the circumference by pi and that will give us the average diameter of the column. So what I want to do now is explain why we don't just measure the diameter directly holding the tape up as long as the column. Um, so measuring curved surfaces is incredibly difficult and you're very likely to introduce a parallax type error. Um, and it's the same kind of error that you get when you're trying to measure volume with a measuring cylinder when the water is curved at the top called the meniscus. So it's the same type of error, but it's very difficult to get accurate measurements with parallax error involved. Um, next, we want to measure the length of a pavement in a road outside of school. So the thing to realize is uh, this is going to be much longer than the length of the tape measure. So you can't just measure it like that. Um, so what we would do is we'd measure the length of the, the paving stones we used to make a pavement. Um, those are the bit along the edge of the pavement next to the road, like the, they're usually grey. Uh, maybe I'd pick five different ones to measure the length of, and then what I'd do is find the average length of one of them, then I'd walk along the road, count the number of stones, and multiply by the average length to find the total road length. Okay. So next you want the average speed of a car traveling along this road while you are standing on a pavement. So first off, we're going to measure a fixed length of road using a tape measure and maybe use a strategy we've just come up with to measure a, a longer distance of road. Then what we're going to do is we're going to use the watch to measure the time taken to travel that fixed distance and average speed is distance over time. So that's fairly straightforward. OK, so moving on to question two, looking at some of the SI or System International units that we use in physics. Um, so these are things you should just know, but let's take a look. So charge we measure in coulombs, which you'll see the symbol C. Uh, capacitance we measure in farads with the symbol F. Frequency is an SI unit we measure in hertz. Stress we measure as a newton per meter squared or as a pascal. Gravitational field strength or the force per unit mass will be in newtons per kilogram. Magnetic flux we measure in Weber's. And then radioactive activity we measure in the Becquerel or BQ. Okay, so now we're going to have a look at some graphical analysis. So 
Uh, we're going to start with a velocity versus time graph, and we want to calculate the distance travelled from this graph. So you should know the distance travelled is the area under a graph like this. So what I'm going to do is I am going to essentially divide it up into four shapes, uh, a rectangle, a trapezium, a rectangle, and a triangle. And I'm going to calculate the area of each of those individual shapes. And then what I'm going to do is add those up, and that gives us the total distance. And in this case, it comes out as 4 to 5 meters. And you'll see from the next question why I decided to break up into these two shapes. It helps us construct the distance versus time graph. Okay. So um, that's what we're going to try and do. So in the first section, we're at constant velocity, which means it's going to be a straight line graph, and it travels 50 meters in the first 10 seconds. During the next 10 seconds, it travels 125 meters, but at increasing speed, so the gradient is going to be increasing during that section. The next section is at constant velocity, and it travels 200 meters during that section. And finally, it's decreasing velocity, so a decreasing gradient, and it travels a total distance of 50 meters during that section. So that's what the distance versus time graph would look like. Okay, so next we're going to go into a slightly different one. So we've got a current versus resistance graph for a circuit with total resistance R and an EMF which is kept constant. So draw a graph of 1 against I against R. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick off three values to help me sketch it. So um, first graph, I went to 60 ohms and got 4 amps, so 1 over 4 is a quarter. Another easy point to pick up is at 30 ohms, where it's 8 amps, so 1 over I would be 0.125. And the final one I picked up was at 40, 1 over 6 is 0.1, blah, 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 blah. and you can plot that fairly easily. So we can see that we've got a straight line graph. And that should not be surprising, because at constant EMF, the current and the resistance are inversely proportional. So when we plot a 1 over I against R, it should be a straight line graph. So that makes sense. OK, so next what we want to do is use the graph to work out what the EMF of the supply is. So the first thing I'm going to do is use Ohm's law. So we know the EMF will be equal to the current through the battery times the total resistance. And I'm going to rearrange that into y equals mx plus c form for the graph. So 1 over i will be equal to 1 over emf times by r. And what that means is the gradient of the straight line graph is 1 over the emf. So we can, next what I'll do is I'll calculate the gradient of the graph. Uh, I'll use 0, 0 as one of the points. So both of those would have 0 subtracted from them. And that gives an emf of 240 volts. And so you can see... Essentially, well, for part three, we've basically already answered that. What we found is that the gradient is the reciprocal of the EMF, or 1 over the EMF. OK, so next graph, we've got a gravitational field strength, or gravitational acceleration, against distance from the centre of the Earth graph. And then it's been turned into a log g against log r graph, which is a straight line with a negative gradient. So the first thing we're going to do is calculate the gradient of the graph. So we're going to do change in y over change in x over the whole graph. So y ends up at 0, starts at 1.16. Uh, x ends at 7.29, but starts, if you look, at 6.7, giving us a gradient of 1.9666, blah, blah, blah. So I'll just give it as minus 1.97. OK, so what can be deduced from the value of the gradient? So let's take our equation for field strength and take logs. So if you take log of both sides, what we'll have is log g. And we've got g times m, so we'd end up with log g plus log m. And we've got that divided by log by r squared, so we'd end up subtracting 2 log r. So if we've got a graph of log g against log r, the gradient is, should theoretically be minus 2, 
And we found out that the gradient was minus 1.96, which is really close to 2. So essentially what it shows is that G is inversely proportional to the distance from the centre of the Earth squared, which is what we expect. OK, so next we're going to look, take a look at the three states of matter, solid, liquid and gas. And we're going to discuss change that occur during melting and boiling. Um, in terms of these four categories. So I'm going to do this in the form of a table and I'm going to highlight some similarities between the two. So, first of all, in terms of melting, when we melt or turn a solid into a liquid, we get a small increase in at atom separation. There's not a massive change because there's a very small change in potential energy. Whereas in boiling, going from liquid to gas, we have a large change in the separation. Um, during both, both of these two, the kinetic energy and therefore the average speed of the molecules is pretty much constant during the phase change because temperature is constant during a phase change. When you go from a solid to a liquid during melting, we actually change the pattern of the molecules as well. So they go from a regular pattern to a random, whereas in boiling, liquid and gases are both random, so that's not really changed. Um, so in terms of internal energy, um, if we are melting or boiling, the internal energy is increasing, and it's increasing due to the electric potential energy increasing. And something that's specific to a to boiling is when you turn something into a gas, what you're doing is you increase the electric potential energy to almost zero, which is why we ignore it in terms of most of the way we model gases. Okay. So suggest and explain two differences which might exist between hydrogen gas at 200 Kelvin and at 200 million Kelvin. So let's look at 200 Kelvin first of all. So at 200 Kelvin, hydrogen will exist as an H2 molecule, so much like it does in our atmosphere. And each of those atoms will be one proton and one electron. And then in terms of what it would like at 200 million, well, it will now be in plasma form. So what's happened is the electrons have gained enough energy, they've escaped from the protons, and we, form, we would form what we call an electron soup. Uh, sounds kind of cool. The other thing that might be happening is you might be getting some fusion. So some of these protons will probably have enough kinetic energy that they're now able to fuse and form helium. Okay, so this next question, we've been given some information and essentially it's about the way we have kept the kilogram as a standard. Um, so the thing I'd like to point out n now, uh, now we're, we're in 2018, is this question is first of all no longer true. Uh, we do not define the kilogram um, in terms of an object anymore, it's now defined in terms of SI, sorry, like constants of the universe, um, but this was a paper from 2006, so quite a while ago. So um, we essentially have in a vault a kilogram uh, made of a material and it's stored in very precise conditions and uh, most of them when we had the meter and all these others were stored in Paris and this one still is or was at the time. Okay so what we're going to talk about is using mass to have a way of counting the number of atoms in a silicon sphere and that sphere is one kilogram. Um, so what we're going to essentially do is think about the precision. So we're told that the masses can be measured to very high precision, better than one microgram in each kilogram. And that's in, we're, we're trying to essentially improve that to two parts in 10 to the 8. And what we're going to try and do is get an idea of measuring the volume and use the density to get a better idea of what the mass is. So that's the general scope. So let's have a look at the actual questions you have to deal with. OK, so first off, what two circumstances could slightly change the mass of the standard kilogram when it is being used for a mass determination? So uh, one of the things that occurs to me is silicon is reasonably reactive, uh, so it can react with gas in the atmosphere and form like silicon oxide or silicon dioxide, which would have a different mass. And the other thing is, well, 
if you're going through some measurements, you might damage your silicon, you might dent it, crack it, and change its mass slightly. And given the precision of the measurements, that's going to have quite an effect. Okay. So what percentage uncertainty is there in a mass measurement accurate to one microgram in one kilogram? So uncertainty, percentage uncertainty is uncertainty divided by value times 100%. So the uncertainty is one microgram, so micro is 10 to the minus 6, gram is 10 to the minus 3 kilograms, therefore the uncertainty would be 1 times 10 to the minus 7 percent. Okay, so what we can do is produce a very pure silicon crystal, and what we can Essentially, if we still got one kilogram and we know the diameter, we can get an idea of the density. So we've got a diameter of 94 millimeters and we know the mass is one kilogram. So what we're going to do is do mass divided by volume to give us the density. And volume of sphere is 403 pi r cubed. Diameter is twice the radius. Um, so then what we can do is put the numbers in remember to convert millimeters to meters and we get a value of 2299.4 blah 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 the values we're using are essentially to 3sf from the diameter so i'm going to give my answer to 3sf as well okay so calculate the uncertainty in measuring the diameter of the silicon sphere if the uncertainty in the volume is to be only two parts in 10 to the 8 so the first thing I'm going to do is figure out what the percentage uncertainty in the volume is. So two parts in 10 to the 8 expressed as a percentage uncertainty is 2 times 10 to the minus 6. And volume is proportional to the diameter cubed. So the percentage uncertainty, the diameter is going to be 2 thirds times 10 to the minus 6. So expressing the uncertainty in the same way we did for the volume, what that means is it's, it's going to be 0.67 parts in 10, 10 to the 8. So essentially one third of what it was before in volume. Okay. So one thing we need to do is measure the spacing of the atoms. If we're going to use the volume and the density, uh, we're going to need to know what the spacing is as well. So um, we can actually find the spacing by using x-ray diffraction and using um, the spacings as like a, a slit, like a normal diffraction. And what we need to do now is suggest and explain a problem with obtaining a high accuracy if one of the conditions is not met. And the conditions are that it's pure and the crystal structure is regular. So if the substance is not pure and there are some impurities, those impurities are going to have different mass. So if you get the total mass and divide by the number of atoms, that will give you the wrong mass for one silicon atom if the impurities have different mass. If it's not regular, when we use x-ray diffraction to find the spacing, we can assume that spacing is consistent. And if it's not consistent, that's going to give you, again, the incorrect value for the mass of an atom. Okay, so silicon has three stable isotopes. What do we mean by an isotope? So an isotope is when you have, they're all of the same element. So that means they have the same number of protons, but they have a different number of neutrons. So why would it be important to know the proportions of these isotopes in a silicon sphere? Well, different isotopes have different masses. So if we just do our calculations assuming they all have the same mass, that's going to be a problem. So what we need to do is know the percentage abundance of each isotope, and then we can get a very good idea of what the average mass of each of those isotopes is. Um, but we can't do that unless we can factor that in. Okay, so it would be better if we only had one isotope involved. It would make our calculations much easier. But why is that going to be a problem? Well, the main problem with it is that isotopes pretty much behave the same way, especially in terms of chemical reactions. They've got the same number of electrons, so they behave pretty much in the same way. So it's pretty tricky to separate out isotopes. 
The only really way we've got to do it would be using a mass spectrometer, which so we can use the different mass of the isotopes as a way of separating them out. And that is actually how we know the percentage of abundance of the different isotopes. But it's not an easy process, so that's why it's difficult to achieve.